So coming up right now, though, I want to give a review, a qu um, give pretty, I would say, a pretty decent review of all the money in the world. We uh, we talked extensively about this, Joe and I, when it was uh, first announced that Christopher Plummer would take over for Kevin Spacey in the film. That that Kevin Spacey, following uh, allegations, following multiple sexual allegations uh, against him, that the role was going to be recast and then subsequently reshot with Christopher Plummer replacing him as J. Paul Getty in the film. Uh, scenes were reshot for the film just about a month before this film came out. It was supposed to come out on December 22nd, got delayed till Christmas Day, so just a three-day delay, even though they had to go back, cost about $10 million to reshoot this film. The big question, did all the money in the world survive its reshoots? Yes, it did. I've been waiting to give an answer to that question for the last month, month and a half now, and I'm proud to say, and I'm happy to say, that the film really did come through at a time against all odds. Now, let me just say this, because this is the thing I think that's on everybody's mind, at least in terms of uh, you know, whether or not this is true. I think Christopher Plummer does a terrific job in here, and I'm going to make the case, and I know it's a very easy, you know, not really a hot take case to make, but I'm going to go as far as to say that I think Christopher Plummer is better than Kevin Spacey would have been at his best in this role. And really because of the fact that Kevin Spacey is is young in terms of how in terms of you know standing up to Jay Paul Getty. Kevin Spacey is only in his, I think in his late fifties. Christopher Plummer is in his late eighties. So to play the elderly Jay Paul Getty in this film, Christopher Plummer does not need extensive amounts of makeup to look like Jay Paul Getty. If you watch the original trailer with Kevin Spacey of All the Money in the World, you knew that Kevin Spacey was like Steve Carell and Foxcatcher, buried under layers of prosthetics. Go back and look at any of the images of Kevin Spacey who uh, playing uh, J. Paul Getty. He was cloaked under uh, uh, makeup. You couldn't tell it was him, no, but at the same time, you recognized in a way that the person you were watching was buried under so many layers of prosthetics and makeup and hair plugs and this, that, and the other. So it was definitely a bold decision to go with Christopher Plummer. It was Ridley Scott's original decision, and it, I think it paid off tremendously because Christopher Plummer also carries a weight in this movie. He carries a good sense of gravity with his performance to the way he can respond to inquiry from a reporter, like how much are you willing to pay to get your son back? And he'll just say, he'll just shrug and say, nothing. I think that his power with words is greater in this sort of setting than Kevin Spacey's was. Kevin Spacey, at least from judging from the trailer and his portrayal of J. Paul Getty, came off as kind of like very obviously weighty where Christopher Plummer's performance comes with weight to his words. There's a difference there. There's a difference between being weighty in a performance and there's a difference between having weight and gravitas as a performance. And I think the difference is Christopher Plummer and Kevin Spacey. Obviously, you can't say that Christopher Plummer is definitively better than Kevin Spacey, but I think at the end of the day, this movie didn't lose anything by recasting at the last minute. Going to dive into the plot, though, of all the money in the world. In 1973, J. Uh, J. Paul Getty III, known as Paul Getty, played by Charlie Plummer, no relation to Christopher Plummer, uh, was is the grandson of the oil tycoon J. Paul Getty, played by Christopher Plummer. He is kidnapped in Rome by this organized crime ring, and the kidnappers demand $17 million in ransom from Gail Harris. That is uh, that is uh, Paul Getty's mother, played by Michelle Williams, who uh, whose father, uh, Paul Getty's uh, father, uh, there is, is strange. He's living. He's living away. He's not uh, really in the picture. Uh, so they're divorced. So he lives primarily with his mother. And he's closest with his mother as well. Now, Gail, though, has no money. Gail has no money. They were She was divorced. It was an ugly divorce battle with the custody involved and stuff like that because she was kind of going up against J. Paul Getty's billion-dollar estate, and this is in 1973 as well. So she's got very little, if any, funds, especially no funds left over from the Getty family after divorcing uh, J. Paul Getty's son. So... As soon as the kidnappers demand $17 million, obviously Gail wants her son back. She doesn't want her son to be injured. She tries to go to J. Paul Getty to get the money, to get the money, get the $17 million, but J. Paul Getty refuses to pay even $1 of the ransom to get his grandson back. He instead asks Fletcher Chase, played by Mark Wahlberg, who is a negotiator, a C uh, former CIA operative, now a uh, Getty negotiator, to sort of investigate the case and try to get Paul back without giving up any money. So it's a very 
very, very risky play here. It's a very risky play. It's dangerous in a lot of ways. It's not really ideal in some ways to, to, get, to try to get him back like this and negotiate with these kidnappers. Luckily, they have uh, Cinquanta, played by Romain Duras, who is one of uh, Paul Getty's uh, abductors in the film as well, who's kind of breaking free, acting as a bit of a mole to the operation. Uh, this is a very suspenseful and well-done film. I was very surprised at the technique behind this movie. Uh, Ridley Scott, whose movies I usually criticize often for having a lot of flash and having a lot of sort of a weight to them. To begin with, there's that word again. Having a lot of like flabbiness to them. Well, the, the problem I've noticed with like Ridley, Ridley Scott's movies is that they have everything they need in terms of a narrative standpoint, but they lack sort of like the details and the crafty elements and the richness that can kind of, you know, makes a movie what you really like about it. Makes a movie something that's very compelling and makes that makes the difference in a movie. He doesn't, you know, favor that kind of cr that, that kind of distraction here. He often nails the setups and the of the environment and stuff that he chooses to capture, and he doesn't deliver on the details the way you you like in a lot of his sci-fi movies. But he does here, which is what I really find exceptional about this film. By keeping things hyper focused on the exchanges between the characters, he never loses sight of the stakes here. And him and writer David Scarpa make this sleek and involving thriller that's got a pulse. It's got this sort of, you know, gravity to it as well. You really feel the stakes in this movie. Um, also, the, the other thing I really got to say, too, is, yes, Christopher Plummer's great. The star of this movie, though, is Michelle Williams. She is in most of the scenes in this film. She rises above uh, her support, her very talented supporting cast of Plummer and Wahlberg and Romaine Duras to be, create an exhaustively emotional performance that still doesn't feel like the token pathos of the movie. She feels like a desperate mother, but she also feels like somebody who's going up against an empire. And you know what? At the core of this movie... It, all the money in the world is about two empires and how they're maintained and how they conduct business when they are being exploited. The obvious empire right here is Getty. He's built off the age-old American idea of striking rich with oil and living off the exorbitant wealth. Uh, Getty could easily pay the $17 million ransom to get his grandson back, but he refuses. Uh, if you know the story already, you'll know that his final offer is pitiful and so self-interested. But... The, the, the fact, though, that he has this sort of ethics that he abides by to keep his uh, empire intact, whether you agree with them or not, because I'll say I certainly don't, but it still winds up being this very interesting exploration. The other uh, person going against their own empire, and don't lose sight of it, is Cinquanta. He The film kind of downplays this in a way. Scarpa downplays this, unfortunately, but I think it still comes through in a lot of ways. Uh, this is the character that sneaks off to a payphone every chance he gets to get to provide Gail and Chase with updates regarding Paul's condition and letting them know what the kidnapper's next move would be. So he stalls when he can, and he tries to reason with Paul in some scenes too, with like comforting tactics that are like facile enough and like, you know, thin enough to be seen as threats by his fellow men, but also like warm enough to be seen as like, maybe this guy is trying to help me in a way by Paul. So there's a lot of different, there's a dichotomy of empires here too, in like terms of how empires are maintained. One is obviously maintained legally, the other is illegally. But the way that like it takes one person to kind of infiltrate this mob, if you will, this empire, is really the most interesting thing about all the money in the world. And on top of all the great performances, on top of a last minute plumber who really makes a splash here, and on top of everything else in this film that really winds up being, you know, interesting interesting and winds up being, you know, compelling. I think that above all, the exploration of empires in this film is something that is very noteworthy. I give all the money in the world three out of four stars. Very solid movie. Great movie to end the year with. Surprised it's not being seen as much as I think it should be. But I think it's a very interesting movie. Again, deals with the deals with empires, deals with greed and self-interest, deals with a lot of great performances. And it's and again, it affirms my belief that I think that Ridley Scott is the best when he's focusing his attentions away from the alien movies.
I think his movies, his solo efforts like Matchstick Men, these sort of, they're, they're either based off books or they're just brainchilds of his own and his own screenwriter's works. I think that his movies are really good. His dramas, his thrillers, I think they're very good. I would have been focusing on continuing to develop, started doing more dramas now in his later life rather than focusing on continuing to develop the alien mythology. So I wish that he would do more of that, but three out of four stars for all the money in the world.